So I actually think I'd like to start first with a question about Race Point, which you started in 2002. And um, <clears throat> what, what, actually, no, I'll start with another question. Why did you decide to write books? Um, and who were you writing for? Yeah, I, I mostly was the first book that nobody read. Um, I wanted to write about um, all the new technology leaders I had been working with, like Steve Jobs, uh, Larry Ellison. Um, I had met Sergey and uh, Larry, but it was a little later. It was like 2002 in Aspen. But um, I, um, I was amazed that these guys were different than the corporate leaders I had worked with. And so I, I was just observing the way they were building companies. And it was called the provocateur, how a new generation of leaders are building communities, not just companies. So it was that sort of angle. And that was the late 90s. And I just wanted to capture all these people that I had met and do that. And then I started realizing how, and this relates to Race Point. By the way, I couldn't use my name. My lawyer didn't tell me I had sold my name to IPG2. So that's why it's called Race Point Global, which is after one of the oldest lighthouses in America off Provincetown. So, uh, but anyway. Um, I, the other books uh, started to seep in because I realized technology obviously was going to change marketing forever. And it was the last category that had, didn't even have an ERP system or enterprise system. So, th and then I was also an early stupid investor in Friendster. And, um, and I, was, I knew that the impact of social media was going to be huge. So I, I was, wanted to write to marketers. Uh, so CM, there, weren't, there wasn't CMO titles then. But I wanted to write to marketers and CEOs, so C-levels, about the coming vast changes in reaching your customers. And I thought social media was the first huge computing wave after HTML that was going to have huge impact. And so I wrote a book that became my biggest bestseller in 2006 called Marketing to the Social Web. And it wasn't because it was a great book. I think it was because it was the first book written on that topic. And then I also learned something about publishing, which was that if you write a more instructive book and it's pretty decent about a new topic, all of a sudden it's in the curriculum of a bunch of schools because we couldn't we were trying to figure out why the book would sell so much in August and January. And then we realized it was like everywhere from Birmingham at the University of Alabama to Columbia, you know, kind of thing. And then my favorite book, the third book I wrote in 2009, which had a telling chapter in it, which is one of the best books I've ever written that nobody read, called Sticks and Stones about digital reputation in 2009. And I had a chapter that um, Harvard Business Review loved called the YouTube juggernaut. And I was, this was seven, eight years ago, I was thinking about it after I met Chad Hurley. And I, even though he was just having fun, I saw a future where most data and most content was going to be presented visually and that there would probably be more of a category of data called visual information versus just videography. And I was playing around with that idea, so I thought that would be a cool thing to write about. So I did that, and I also, this is a long answer to a simple question, I also figured out how to write a book within six to nine months. You know, how to research it, write it, have a, a helper. You know, uh, I had two MBA students do research, then I had a ghostwriter who I finally have given her credit, uh, so I'm not a complete sexist ass, uh, who would say, who would say, Larry, you wrote that last week. You know, that's not another chapter kind of thing. And then um, I drifted to a bigger topic, which did OK, the book before this one. This is a bestseller now, called, but that, that one was called Everywhere. And it was my view that social media was not just impacting marketing. It was impacting the way we did HR. It was impacting the way we did finance. It was impacting the way we did sales. So I was tr in Everywhere, I was trying to take it different. I think that was a little early. And this one seems just about right. And this one has its roots. It's called The Digital Marketer, 10 New Skills You Need to Know to Stay Customer-Centric. It's about what I think is today in the future of marketing, which is what Race Point represents, is my idea of building the Frankenstein of an agency. And we can talk about that, uh, Frankenstein in a good way, you know, the perfection uh, kind of thing. But this one was here because my publisher, Wiley, of the last four books, Random House was the first one, but the, my publisher uh, said, uh, 
what's your next marketing book, Larry? And I said, well, let me see what's out there right now. So I went on Amazon and I Googled things too. And I realized that what is being written even today is there's the experts on search, there's the experts on marketing automation software, there's the experts you know, on content uh, creation and content strategy, you name it, a slice. But nobody, I thought, had written the book like David Ogilvy's Ogilvy on Advertising, where he sat back in 1965 and went, okay, let's look at the entire sort of New Yorker map you know, of marketing and advertising and, and all that. And it was a brilliant, really, landscape. And I, so what this book attempts to be is let's look at the entire digital landscape of, from software to search to visual to content to, so, you know, a lot of software and, and write about that so that then you can dig down. Instead of drilling down first, you know, get sort of a thing. So that's why I write. And also, the last reason I write is it's, really good at getting business because when my competitors are giving business cards, I'm handing out books, you know, so. <laughs> so um, I'll ask one or two quick follow-ups on that. The, so y in some regards, you didn't even anticipate who you were writing for, like the college students, for yeah. instance. Yeah. Um, I just got interested in different topics. Yeah, yeah. have, have um, as it relates to it's a good way to build business or uh, different types of access and exposure, do, do you, specifically as it relates to the college students, how do you see colleges treating this type of career path differently? Or do you, uh, where, you know, at, at places where maybe they've invited you to talk after buying lots of your books? Yeah, I've been a, a lot of the marketing, like San Jose State, BU, these kinds of, and I think they're finally getting it. They're teaching a little more around search, around content strategies, but I think that they're still caught up, the professors are still caught up in a operational world that has the head of advertising or the head of direct marketing or the head of PR and they, they haven't completely adopted the what I the, the earned paid and owned media concept of, of, of putting things together. I think they're trying. I think Columbia is really trying hard, especially in their journalism school, to change the way we view the way content is produced and presented. But the one place that they're missing is this integration of software. And I have not seen that around when I've talked. And the kids get afraid a little bit. And I can't believe this, but because most of these kids are English majors that are interested in the marketing uh, or, or history majors or, you know, and I said, you've got to understand basic coding. You just have to. You're just going to have to force yourself. It's like eating spinach when you're 10, you know, and, and you're, because you're, you're going to have to understand how to integrate the best software tools you have available to reach your customers directly, consistently, and in an engaging way. And I think that's where at, we're sort of at that period that it's really hard to to bring that together, but it's going to happen. I mean, you know, and the other thing I learned about that, not from schools, but was going to spend time, I had sold, a, uh, I was on the board of a company we sold to Marketo, and so I went and spent time with that CEO and CMO, and then I spent time with the Eloqua guys, and then my friends at HubSpot, you know, because, you know, Brian and Darmesh, but um, and, and when, they hate when I say this. But um, when it, we really studied those the products, they're really very simple and and they're not very complex. I don't mean they mean, need to be complex, but I think they make mistakes. They're not, you know, they they aren't integrated properly necessarily with Salesforce or other C, uh, advanced CRM systems. Uh, these kinds of things. So we're in this world right now where I, I really think it's like year one of the new marketing, which is going to, again, be around data software, but still creativity and content and visualization. And some schools are getting that, starting to get that. But it, again, it's a different type of career path. And I think what the kids are looking for are companies like Google to help teach them some of those things that they might get the basics at these universities, you know, you know around the you know the the basics of purchase theory and and pricing and you know things that marketing and sales should should understand, but that I want to go to Amazon or Google or Facebook because they can teach me more about the future of things, which by the way is not all, all, always innovative. As I was telling Sheryl Sandberg, she thought native advertising two years ago was just so cool. I said, you know, Cheryl, we've been doing that for 30 years. We called it advertorials, you know, and we labeled it an ad. All right. So 
Um, there's a lot of reinventing of, of, of things that's going on, but what is changing is the objectives of marketing. I think it should be more about engagement time and more, you know, um, less about the purchase and more about the engagement, you know, the, sh the shareability, those kinds of things. So, but anyway. So uh, just as a quick poll question, I how many, <laughs> what's that? I just said I could go on and on. But I, I know, that's why you're here. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that's why I didn't have to write too many questions. Um, how many had a, a major that was something like a liberal arts major in this room? See. Okay. And how many had a business major? Computer science. And how many had a computer science oriented major? So weighted towards the... Towards yeah. the, the but it's yeah. good that you're all in the same room. You know, that, that when I started 35 sort of years ago, and IT was just beginning, you know, I mean, we looked so different in marketing versus the IT guys. And then I remember over the years in, in Boston, all of a sudden there were all these, but by the way, there were only two C titles when I started in business. There was the CEO and the CFO. And then all of a sudden, this Fortune 500 company I was working with had a COO. And I was intrigued to see what their responsibilities were. And I read the responsibilities, and they seemed like the same stuff the CEO and the CFO was supposed to do. And anyway, I moved here in early uh, 80, 1982, and that's when I got into technology marketing, because I mistakenly went to a party, or actually fortunately went to a party, and met a barefoot guy named Mitch Kapoor, who was starting a software company called Lotus, and we hit it off and you know introduced most of their products. But anyway, um, there were all these titles back then called MIS. I mean, some of the older people must remember MIS, Managers of Information Services. And companies hired so many of those that they had another C title, CTOs. And then all those people started buying all this software, and the CTOs didn't understand the software, so they had a CIO. And then we went through this period in the 90s where everybody was making so much money that we decided to have titles like Chief Talent Officer and Chief Knowledge Officer and Chief Strategic Officer. <coughs> and then in the 2000s, which I think is, <coughs> excuse me, fascinating, is the fastest growing title in, in corporate America, especially is CMO. <coughs> so, and I think it, it's easy to deduce then that every time we have a really fucked up category of business, we just put a C title on it, you know, <laughs> to, try to, to try to straighten it out uh, kind of thing. And now, it's so funny, my clients right now range from IBM, General Electric, Kaiser Permanente, uh, John Deere, the Page Family Foundation, emerging companies, and I'm starting to see CMO titles get thrown out, and we're having the chief customer office, and the chief engagement officer, and the chief experience officer, so we're definitely in another C title renaissance, you know. In no particular order, yep. you mentioned the uh, Page Family Foundation. Yep. That's Larry Page. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys even and know. Lucy. Lucy. Yeah, yeah, Larry and Lucy. Do you guys, I don't, you guys might not even know what kind of stuff that that family foundation is involved with, and it might just be interesting for you to know. Do you want to describe what you're doing with them and what their yeah, what the programs are? Yeah, there two things I learned. I should have known this about Google in, in the beginning, because we had also done some work for 23andMe, um, and from the other guy, just former wife. But the, um, there's this, you know, just by nature of Google, the, the CDC was very interested in searches in specific areas about, you know, if all of a sudden somebody's, you know, all, all of San Diego goes off the charts looking for flu symptoms, then, you know, there's a connection between you guys and the CDC that says, oh my God, you guys better check out with the, the health officials in San Diego because we, you know, the searches for flu are just, you know, over the, you know, over the chart, off the charts. And um, so we were approached by, our San Francisco office was approached by the Page Fund, Family Foundation because for some reason, um, Lucy and Larry had made a point that we're worried about all these diseases that might affect one or two people, yet like 40,000 people die of complications of the flu every year. And it's avoidable if you get your kid to have a flu shot, but it turns out that a lot of parents don't trust a flu shot and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So they said, let's try a, you know, sort of experiment just in one city urban area, and they picked Oakland. 
And so we, our creative team came up with an uh, idea called Shoe the Flu. And it's, um, it's a whole educative through video. Uh, we use traditional media like billboards, uh, you know, in downtown Oakland, uh, television, that kind of stuff, to try to really ramp up the um, the, uh, the the rate of getting uh, your kids vaccinated, and it really works. So look, we're in the planning stages now of going sort of urban area by urban area to start to do that. But that's just a very they do a lot more than that. That's just you know one sort of example. But it's also a great marketing example because it's a combination of search, it's, uh, of use of, of software, of old-fashioned creative, of video content, of, you know, education, educational materials, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I, I think before I knew, in fact, I'm sure, before I knew that A, the uh, Page Foundation was involved with that, and B, you guys were involved with that, I had identified that as a campaign that I've used in several presentations um, in, as part of kind of the feel, think, do, you know, continuum, because it really does a good job of addressing, we, we, one of the um, uh, models we use for talking about consumer experiences, um, feel, think, do, mm -hmm. and loyalty, um, or bond. And uh, I thought that does a wonderful, I, I thought then and still think it does a wonderful job in the think and do area, because it enab it, you enable the parent to do research and get comfortable with the flu shot concept, and then actually take it to getting the shot itself. So yeah. it actually then directs them to a place where they can get the shot. So I've, I use it in many presentations as uh, something that, that fulfills fills the, the think and do component. Um, can we talk about Frankenstein? And, oh, sure. And what your kind of um, hypothesis or epiphany was to, to build yeah, a different I, type of agency, I a different type of company? One of the problems I've had being around this long <laughs> is, um, is the three strands I was in back in the early 80s introducing software companies. And then I was lucky enough in 1992-3, was probably a very seminal time for at least me, when we were invited, well, let me tell you a story and then I'll get to Frankenstein. Um, we were doing, we still do work for the labs at MIT, so we still represent the media lab I have for 25 years, um, both at the previous company and this company. And for about 15 years, we represented the lab for computer science, which arguably is the one that has really produced the, the things that have changed, you know, I mean, Ethernet, the spreadsheet, RSA security, I mean, you know, really have changed a lot of things and made Kendall Square so hot, I think. Um, but um, I was called uh, by the guy that had started that, Michael Dratuzos, who was a big consultant to, um, to Bill Gates, uh, and uh, was also one of the founders of Davos, you know, the World Economic Forum. And he called, because he was mad that Nicholas uh, Negroponte was a wonderful man, a bit acerbic, but... Uh, and a good, tell everyone who he is. Uh, he founded the Media Lab, and also One Laptop Per Child, which was very popular sort of from 2007 to, still around, 2014, a little green. He was trying to get, uh, he should get the Nobel Prize, by the way, uh, not for the Media Lab, but uh, for bringing the cost of computing down in one fell swoop. I mean, in 2007, when we introduced the uh, XO, which we named um, the little green uh, laptop, people yelling at Nicholas from Dell to uh, HP to IBM was still in the business, uh, Lenovo, because what it forced their hand was, hey guys, you can't get, you know, $2,000, you know, for a laptop anymore. And, he was uh, delivering laptops to kids in Africa that, that right. were less than 100 bucks a piece, right? We didn't get below 100. Didn't we got to about $148 or something like that. And obviously now India has some for... I mean, eventually you should be able to get it free, just like there'll be free smartphones, so, um, which definitely will happen in your lifetime. Uh, the devices will mostly be free. That's why Apple's becoming a fashion company, and to me, not a technology company as much anymore. But um, even though their software is what got them here, <laughs> you know. But um, the, uh, the, to finish that story, I met a, Michael had come over, and he brought a videotape. Who brings a videotape to a meeting anymore, right? Uh, and, um, it, and he brought a little British man with him that had just joined his organization. Right here, he's still here at that the Ray Stata building, you know, the, the weird uh, Frank Geary uh, uh, building that still leaks. Um, but anyway, um, uh, his, his name was Tim Berners-Lee. And so Tim sat there very quietly. Um, he had brought his experiment or his research called HTML. To, uh, to the lab for computer science, and 
He, by the way, called it the World Wide Web. He asked if that was catchy, but anyway. And, um, but Michael puts in this video, and it was him on, are you familiar with the Today Show on uh, NBC? Yeah. All right. Um, I ask because my 25-year-old and 22-year-old daughters have no idea what like the Today Show is, okay? Um, anyway, uh, so it was on the occasion, he had written a big bestseller, Michael, with a guy who still teaches here at 89 years old, Nobel Prize winner for economics in 1997, Robert Solo. And they wrote a book together called Made in America in 1981. And that's why he was on the Today Show. And it was of like 12 years earlier. Uh, this, and a guy named Brian Gumbel was the main host. He's on television a little bit still in his brother's sports. But he's starting to interview him. And the book, by the way, was it was, this was a time the older people will remember when our economy really sucked and the Germans and the Japanese were really eating our lunch. And the main reason was they had new factories and we didn't, but nobody talked about that at the time. But this book, Made in America, argued that you should all just chill because the, America has one thing that no other country has, Germany, Japan, uh, you know, and they weren't really looking at China at the time because it was still sort of disorganized there. But, and it was called, this thing called software and that we had the ability to use creativity and computer technology to actually create so many things that would lead to economic prosperity for decades and decades to come. And so he's talking about this on this TV show, and uh, the IBM PC had just been launched too, and those old enough to remember, it was the first time there were ads on television, they used a Charlie Chaplin look-alike uh, who was stacking boxes and it was actually a very popular advertisement at the time. And what happened was um, um, Brian Gumbel looks over and says, now this PC kind of thing, this is just a fad, right? This is all going to go away. And uh, Professor Dutuzos leans over the, the interview table and goes, not only is it not going to go away, but within 20 years, everyone will have one of these on their desk. And they will be buying and selling things. And they will be sharing information. And they will be learning from these machines. And he was describing what has happened. you know. And Brian Gumbel says, we have to cut for commercial, because this is crazy. <laughs> All right. So I only bring that up because then the background of understanding and launching HTML and you know the World Wide Web Consortium, understanding marketing and telling technology stories for software companies and technology companies, and then understanding the media were all starting to come together. And then I was stupid enough to sell a company growing at 50% a year in 1996, 97 to a big, to Mad Men, and they really were Mad Men. I mean, you know, at five o'clock, they started with the martinis right in the office, and, uh, you know, I won't even go into the other stuff, but, uh, you know, and... Um, What's your next book? <laughs> well, <laughs> Names uh, my wife said to retire before I write the book of working with everybody from, from Steve Jobs to Muammar Gaddafi, so, you know, what an odd career, but um, the... Um, the, what I started to understand, well, first of all, I sold too early, but that's okay. I got to spend seven years on Madison Avenue and uh, help them buy their first digital uh, agencies. They didn't even know what that was. Um, one was called RGA that has flourished quite quite well. Uh, I'm sure you guys work with. And, um, and I built Weber Shandwick then. I bought 31 companies around the world. and and and. But what I was learning was what I've always tried to see is what the vision of the perfect marketing service company would be because the agency world was going to change was my determination. It can't depend on television commercials forever. Now, I thought this was, again, going to, I thought television was going to die much earlier. And it, have you noticed, by the way, this is a, just a, my ADD medicine's not kicking in, but the, uh, the, you know, have you noticed that there's more live events on television than there's ever been? And you know why that is, right? It's much harder to, to get rid of a commercial on live events. And so they're look, all the big TV companies, I mean the uh, NBCs, the CBSs, they're all looking for more that they can present. So that's why they're trying to get European soccer to have a following and, you know, more reality shows and, you know, so that you can't delete, you know, that commercial. But back to Frankenstein, so I learned all the way through all of this, through technology, 
having the largest office in Palo Alto of any PR firm, you know, for years, um, watching the failures of, of startup companies and that. And then by the time my earnout was over, I stayed two more years and I said, you know what, there's got to be a different model for this. And I made the mistake of saying, all right, what I'm going to do is my holding company, I'm going to have what's next in every category and only digitized. So what's next in advertising, what's next in direct, what's next in data and analytics, what's next in PR, and they're all going to have separate names and we're all going to be one big happy family and we're going to be the future. And I realized um, that after 2008 came, nobody wanted to buy old stuff, let alone new stuff. And that was really tough. So I went through three years of it just, it was just terrible. And finally, IBM and General Electric and Kaiser, all about the same time, said, you know, Larry, your ideas are right, but they should all be integrated and put together. And this should be one agency kind of, you know, offering. It shouldn't just be, and you know, so, that's when we started to really integrate everything. So, but we have to lead with a point of view, and that's what I call earned media, which is a fancy name for PR. So, how do you get covered in the blogs? How do you get covered on TechCrunch? How do you get covered in WallStreetJournal.com, Forbes.com, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we quickly moved then to a creative department, a technology department. We've developed two software products around influence so that we can identify the 100 most influential people to a specific company or a product and where their, what are their social properties. So we know what one reporter really likes to tweet, another one doesn't, who their friends are on Facebook, you know, et cetera, you know, kind of, kind of things. So we're really working deeply from an influence perspective and, and then I argue that the future of an agency is going to be about a new solar system model where the sun, if you take this metaphor, the sun is the customer and all the planets going around it are things like marketing automation, software, content, visualization, data analytics, all that and some of those are all going to collide and become sort of together kinds of things but you know, it's, um, it's, it's going to be an interesting time right now. There's a reason that there wasn't a marketing ERP system. Uh, you know, and every other category had one. You know, HR was PeopleSoft. Uh, you know, finance was SAP. You have database was Oracle. You can go down the line, and um, and I think um, you know the the reason was what is one the Madison Avenue Mafia and London and Paris now, uh, who are trying to keep television alive. I, I think that's uh, and how they're going to do that is combining more with you guys and doing as much as they can to you know, prop up, you know, the, the, the media spends that they have. But um, uh, my view is that, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a alignment of consulting, of creative, of technology, of software. Um, Deloitte, for example, a bunch of accountants just bought a San Francisco digital agency. Interesting to me, right? Uh, that they would, uh, you know, now do everything from sort of conceptual consulting, much like a Bain or a a BCG all the way through execution of a, of a campaign digitally. Uh, and then uh, we see competitors, you know, from any given day, Sapient and uh, Digitas to Ogilvy is a big competitor of ours now, and to the big PR firms who are actually really lagging still because PR is still a category that waits for stuff to happen and then reacts versus being very aggressive about making things happen, which is more the paid side of the world. And, and so um, it's been, a, it's been a, f a fascinating time right now, but I think the next five years are going to be interesting in this convergence. And I think, uh, you know, companies like Google are right at the heart of this, you know, as one of the sumo wrestlers for the heart and soul of the, the future of the web. Um, I don't know if you've saw, seen the tech um, or the Venture Beat article last week. Uh, on the era of messaging, if anybody anybody see that, I recommend looking at that uh, article uh, as it will impact your business. And it, I thought they went a little too far that messaging is going to be so explosive and that that's going to be a new a new advertising model and marketing model. But it's another play in the the thing. I'm on the board of the largest social network in Africa. It's called uh, Mixit M I X T, and it's it's. Uh, it's a feature phone uh, kind of, so more like a WhatsApp 
for Africa uh, kind of thing. And it's interesting to see the different uses of messaging. And, and, and then that brings to, I'm sure you guys are studying this completely, but in this last book, I talk a lot about if I was a young kid and I was interested in marketing, I'd get into loyalty, digital loyalty or couponing. I think that is still in the, in the dark ages and how that's going to happen contextually. I'll give you an example. I was on a panel with Howard Schultz two years ago, a year and a half ago, and um, in Washington. And after we were all talking uh, afterwards, and he said, would you be a guinea pig for a marketing thing we're trying to do at Starbucks? And I said, oh, OK, sure. And I didn't hear anything from him or, or anybody from Starbucks. But about a month later, I get an email that introduced a person in the marketing department at Starbucks. and said, uh, thanks for agreeing to, to do this test program with us. And um, would you fill out this sort of survey? It was like a survey monkey, only customized to Starbucks. And I, you know, it asked me questions like, when you go to Starbucks, what time usually is it? What's your favorite thing you order? If you order food, what food do you order? Do you buy for your family or other people, or is it pretty much, so does somebody buy for you? You know, and so they were asking some pretty, good questions, even though it was only about eight to nine, ten questions. And then would you give us your cell phone number? And I said, sure. Yeah. You know, by the way, I'm, I, I'm from the Scott McNeely School of Privacy. I don't believe it exists anymore. The, so I'm okay with it, except in the future, I think you health... You have to tell everyone who Scott McNeely is. Oh, he was one of the founders of Sun Microsystems that was bought by Oracle. Yeah. Uh, and um, they had the software, um, Java was the, one of their big uh, software platforms. Anybody uses Java uh, anymore? But uh, anyway, um, he also said privacy is dead. Get over it. So, but I do think it's going to be an important discussion around health data. But I don't care if somebody knows I like pink shirts from Brooks Brothers. I really don't. Care. In fact, it should work in my advantage that somebody knows that uh, you know kind of thing. But um, um, the uh, to finish the the Starbucks story. So I, I had forgotten about it again because they didn't do anything. I didn't get any offers or anything. But So I'm with my middle daughter in London. Uh, she had some time off. so um, Or no, I know she was doing one of those junior year things in Edinburgh. And I had her come down to London to see a show. And um, so we, um, we were waking up at the hotel. And um, I said, well, let's go get some breakfast somewhere. And, and, and right when I said that, I, 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 that was, I'm sure, coincidental, I get a text from Starbucks. And it says, yeah, I say, hi, Larry. It says, hi, Larry, um, why don't you come across the street to 325 Kensington High Street for your free iced espresso? And we'll give you 25 pence off your uh, breakfast sandwich. And I went, Julia, let's go over there. Now, Julia, of course, I, I think this is cool. Julia, being 21-year-old co-ed at a, one of those fancy schools uh, that cost too much, uh, says, Dad, that's sort of creepy. They could have, like, sent a drone, you know, on top of you, you know. And um, I'm like, well, no, let's go see if this works, you know. So we went in, and I said, I think I have a free iced espresso and you know, some money off a breakfast sandwich. And she says, okay, I haven't seen that before, but, you know, so I hold it up, and it goes through. And so I get it, and I thought that was pretty cool. And then you know, then I started thinking about all that must have had to go into that because, and I started thinking about things like contextual marketing, like, which is, I think, and predictive analytics, which are going to be the two of the biggest areas uh, in the next few years. And I, w I was thinking, well, what if they offered me like an iced herbal tea and I hate herbal tea, you know, and, and they would have set the relationship back, right, a little with me, even though it was a free offer. So that's what I mean about the complexity in the future of this sort of digital loyalty and points and programming. And then I was trying to use points to go down to see a college with my youngest son the other day, and it was such a pain in the ass to try to use my Delta points still. And I'm like, who's going to come up with just, it is so easy. Mr. Weber, you have 900,000 points, and I still had to pay full price for my <laughs> ticket. And I was like, my God, this is just insane, you know. And it, I should be able to just hold up that smartphone. You guys organize it. You, Delta, or I'm going to JetBlue. You organize it. I don't want to have numbers, cards. I don't want any of that, you know, kind of thing. Sorry. I, 
De I Delta just, hit a loyalty nerve with me there. I, I had exactly the same conversation with somebody, maybe in this room, but certainly someone here at Google in the last week about United and exactly the same conversation. Um, it was painful. It was a painful experience. Um, does anyone have any questions for Larry? Okay, good, because I have more, but it, I should shut up. Is this okay? Is this making sense for you guys? Okay. I can answer things about the future search, too, if you want. <laughs> hey, Larry, thanks for being here. Um, quick question about, it's a more of a hypothetical desert island scenario. If you were taken out of your current position and said, okay, you have to start a widget company from scratch, limited budget, what's your hier hierarchy of needs for techniques? Because when we're talking to clients and they think this omni-channel, they're often having a conversation with us is, okay, search, display, they start talking about things and what they think the opportunity cost of this dollar spent here or that, and then they start thinking, well, does PR give us SEO benefit? Does this happen? We have limited people, we have limited money. So if I put you in a scenario where you are supposed to build a brand from scratch yep. and you don't have any of your current resources, how do you go about building that plan? Yeah, that's easy for me. Um, good question. Um, I am not a big believer in quant. So that makes me pitted against a lot of people right away because they want quant. They want massive reach to customers and they want it right away and they want startups to scale right away and this. What I would argue to build a great lasting brand today, and I talk with Reid Hoffman about this all the time, he thinks LinkedIn will last for 100 years and that's what they're trying to do. And I think it'll be replaced just like Monster was. But anyway, the um, what, what I would do is I would have strategies, marketing strategies around engaging customers and I would measure, I would measure the length of engagement, the content that's working, the content that's not working, and I would enlist them as the salespeople. How do you create a brand around some kind of passion? And I think even old companies can reinvent, reinvent that way. One of the coolest assignments we have right now which took nine months of fighting against the, um, the, uh, the heads of marketing is a company called John Deere. And I was having a drink with its CEO who said to me after two drinks, he said, Larry, I don't know what my legacy is going to be. I don't want it to be that I just sold more green tractors. And so we started talking about this. And there's a reason I'm bringing this up because it can be done for startups too, all right? And I said, well, let's see. Let's look at the facts about where you live. You're a $50 billion company, and you're collecting more farm data than anybody on the planet, right? And he was his assistant, or one of his sidekicks, was quoting these numbers so I could get a picture in my head that when I was a kid, there were 22,000 farms in America. Today, there's 8,000 farms, but they're three times as big. And they're also really complicated on weather, uh, the you know, uh, soil content, fertilizer. I mean, you name the data that you know is needed to manage a farm. And then they started talking about their peer group and that their peer group is Caterpillar and Kubota. And I said, and then somebody mentioned too that, you know what, there's gonna be two billion more people that have to be fed and we can't ruin the planet. How do we, you know, have a better yield and how do we sort of do good and, and you know, that kind of stuff. And so we went back to a, with a program that said, forget your peers are Caterpillar and Kubota, just forget it. Your, your peers are Google, Amazon, and Apple, John Deere. And of course, they looked at me like I had you know, three heads because they're like, no, I, we don't understand. We don't compete with Amazon. I said, it's not about competition. It's how you approach the way and the, the work that you're doing and how you're going to be innovative about this. They had so much software that they had developed to help manage farms, all right, and data. And so we're now working on this huge program about how they're not really about the tractors. Yes, they are but they're about feeding the next two billion people and they're about helping manage farms smarter and better and more effectively. And this led me to a marketing theory, even for smaller companies, that you know what's gonna happen now? And this is a really scary prediction. I actually think big software companies are gonna fail long term. I think you're gonna see Oracle and SAP. I think these companies are gonna have a lot of trouble. And I think what's gonna happen is you're gonna see GM, John Deere, they're 
uh, hiring more and more developers. They're cu customizing more and more software. They're managing more data and analytics, and they're engaging customers with important decisions, you know, making tools. And I think Google's got to sit in the middle of that, but I also think that's where your marketing strategy has to go. So, you know, there's a company spinning out of, you guys must know this company, spinning out of MIT called Ditto, and they have a really cool technology around analyzing videos and photographs so that they can get, they know where you bought that shirt by analyzing it on Facebook or Instagram. Now, I don't ask me how they can do that one, all right? But same thing, how do you both, you know, start to get that message out to marketers and to the customers that they want in a more educative way, not in an in-your-face way, and how do you, you know, create engagement and content strategies and things like that. So, and then on the earned media side where you said PR, I still think that carries a lot of weight. Look at TripAdvisor alone. I was saying, I was talking to the CEO, you know, he's there, there it looks like they're going to be sued by the country of Mexico because there's so many bad there's so many bad reviews of the beaches and you know the resorts in Mexico that they feel they've lost the government feels that their businesses there have lost like 4 or 5 billion dollars and they're blaming TripAdvisor of course i would just say well make the beach nicer right or you know make me a stronger drink you know or something like that but you know but so i a part of what is also waste and i wish google would spend time on this too or somebody would is we don't have the metrics in this new generation of marketing that the 60s, 70s, 80s or the Mad Men had with CPMs and all that. You know, they were so good at bullshitting the client, you know, on what was really measurable. And we don't have that. You know, nobody's grabbing the baton and saying, is engagement time important? All right. Is a share index important? All right, is organic search. Nobody talks about organic search anymore. We were talking about it at lunch, how important that is. It's not just the paid search. It's, gee, I Googled 20 times today and I got the information I want. Or I did make a purchase with a small company I've never worked with before, you know, and that kind of thing. So anyway, I think there's a whole metric world that hasn't been brought together to, that's a long answer to, you know. But uh, we're, we're paying bloggers more and more. So that's another strategy I think is interesting. So. Hello. Hi. Um, so you were talking about the Frankenstein agency and how everything is going to be integrated and talking to each other. Can you share um, how you think mobile is going to affect that? Uh, what's going to be the tipping point for mobile and when you think companies are going to actually start caring? Yeah. Um, Well, first, I come from the school that there's no such thing as mobile. So I think just everything is mobile, right? You know, you can take anything anywhere, uh, I guess. But um, I think companies want, again, to see that metric result that if they're doing loyalty programs like Starbucks was testing on me, they want to see that that's really working from a loyalty perspective. So I think there's a real measurement thing to mobile around. I don't think it's around banners. I don't think it's around you know, that kind of uh, mobile marketing. I think it's going to be about community building, engagement, um, messaging, I think is going to be important, uh, couponing, loyalty, all those kinds of stuff. And some companies are really getting it. I mean, business to business companies, you know, aren't as much yet, but, um, you know, uh, a deer is using mobile apps to show how you can get better yield. So you have to show both the you know, information and the data side as well as the sales side, you know, in some of these kinds of, um, these kinds of efforts or stories. And, um, but I think obviously everything's going to be smartphone driven. I, I don't, I'm not sure about the watch. Is that coming out this week? Yeah. I'm just not sure if that's just a paradigm, trying to make an old paradigm better. I, I, I just don't know, you know. Um, I definitely wouldn't pay 17000 for, uh, you know, a watch. But um, I think the more senior people that come to me, are they're looking for brand engagement. How are we going to engage audiences for a long period of time? So I'm less in the transaction business and more in the engagement and, and brand engagement business. Because um, I think brand is defined as the conversation you have with your customer. The weaker the conversation, the weaker your brand, the stronger the conversation 
the stronger your brand. Of course, there's a quant side to everything. You know, how are we going to sell more orange juice? You know, and yeah, and I think all the analytic companies. I mean, we have way too many of them, but I think they're working working hard on all that kind of software to uh, to to deal with that. And there's mobile mobile software and kinds of things. But you know, for Facebook to spend 22 billion dollars for WhatsApp, I mean. That tells you they see some vision of advertising, you know, in in messaging that is uh, very, or else they're just stupid. You know, I don't know. Anyone else? I have another one. If no one, okay. Hey, Larry, you talked to obviously senior executives at a wide variety of companies and company types. What do you hear about Google? What do senior executives say about Google? In uh, you know, kind of. At a, at a mac from a macro perspective, if they do, and what do they, they think understand. their relationship with Google should yeah. be? I think if they understand Google at all, there's very much a from a search point of view and a paid search point of view, they realize there's sort of a real basic algorithmic value to Google. So obviously, you've won the search, at least search as it exists today. You've won that, and we need to spend money in that. Because if I make hot red convertibles at Ford, and I'm in charge of marketing that, I better own sexy hot red convertible. You know, uh, best price for that kind of thing. I think they get that. I think some of the things they don't get is why is Google trying everything? Like why, you know, what is really this Internet of Things, and why do they want a driverless car, and why are they in looking at healthcare, and what are the glasses about, and why, you know, is it how is this going to impact me, my brand, and what we're doing? And I think, you know, to remain an innovator, you have to do that stuff. But I think the clarity of how you're going to help big brands, I think, can be better. I think, I think right now it's more on that paid search level and more in the era when most people wake up and go to your landing page before anything else, you know, and something, how does that help me, you know, at IBM or how does it help me at, you know, um, John Deere? And I think that needs some more corporate understanding of brand versus just the um, tactical work, yeah. But I think they respect Google. I think the smarter people, the smarter conversations I have, like, um, you know, are who do you think the two or three people that might win, you know, this sort of everything from Internet of the Things to, uh, um, you know, the next wave of computing, mobile, mobility, uh, you know, all, all that. And I constantly say it's the, the two biggest sumo wrestlers, in my opinion, are Amazon and Google. And, uh, you know, the last time I saw, you know, Bezos give it, being interviewed, uh, at one of those highfalutin, uh, you know, techonomy kind of things, um, the 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 interviewer said, "How does it feel to be one of the greatest uh, retailers of all time?" And he looked vis physically disturbed. <laughs> and uh, he said, "He said he wears this baseball hat now, really low." And he goes, "I am not a retailer." And the uh, <laughs> the interviewer went. Okay, but well what are you? He goes, I'm the biggest sucker of data on the planet. That's what he said. And so to show more, I think, the positioning of Google, how you're the next generation of data collection, and how you use that to create better brands, I think it is an important juncture right now. By the way, I don't think Apple's in that, uh, in that race or that conversation. I think Facebook is questionable. And maybe there's a new company it's, there's always a new company, but it's not Dropbox or Box, and you know it, it's um, you know and it's something you know. Twitter should have been more video and visual, you know. So there's probably a, a startup that's trying to play with co-creation of, of visuals or real-time sharing. Um, Snapchat is interesting. It's getting into ads and you know and and. Um, uh, things Instagram still is growing quite a bit, so it seems to be a bit of a model. But again, I don't see the impact that like a Google has had. Um, I, I you know the one time I a couple times I had met your your founders early in their careers, just um, just refreshing young men at the time. You know, uh, 
really just trying to figure out how they could make the world move the world ahead. And uh, I think they really meant that they wanted Google to be a really good company. And I don't think people get that sense as much that you've gotten so big. What do you do that's good? You know, what do you, what do, you do as a good company for the planet, for people? Yeah. So. I think that's a good place to stop then. Um, thank you, Larry. Thanks very yeah, much and for, if you, for joining. Yeah, thanks.